This is called ice. This is what winter in America feels like. Oh, and them's are on that list. <laughs> Yes, hello, this is Carrie. Pick up who? I'm just supposed to help them find jobs. You must be the guys from uh, Somalia, Senegal. Sudan. Did your luggage come down the chute? Great. Where is your husband? No, I'm not married. I provide for myself. Your survival skills are very impressive. Thanks. I'll call you tomorrow morning and we'll start the job hunt. I need your help. Are there any dangerous animals in this area? Such as lions. <laughs> no, there's no lions here. You, you're safe. What's their story anyway? I'm not sure. They seem pretty traumatized. Made my way to the borderline. I had 34 brothers and sisters, and they all died but one. And she need to be here with us. You don't have an appointment. Who do I have to screw around here to see an immigration supervisor? Me. Thanks, Cupcake. That's gonna be a problem. All flights from the Kakuma refugee camp have been stopped. Since 9-11, the program here has stopped indefinitely. She's a child refugee of war. You sure you're ready to take this on? Definitely. You're being asked to make choices no one should have to make. I don't think they're gonna make it if they're not together. I will pray for you, Yardi. Yardi? It is a special name for you. It means great white cow. Well, it's better than a lot of things I've been called. I will find a way. Woo! I will find a way. Don't know how it'll be okay, but I'll find a way. Ah! Holy crap! You can't just break into somebody's house. There is a reason you do not have a husband. Okay, thank you so much. Rated. Did we win the cup? Did we win the championship? <laughs> What's happening? Everybody right here, thank you so much. Let's do everybody straight ahead. Here we go. And tell you right again. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Toronto for raising me to love movies. Everyone has a big imagination, all of us do. This is exciting, my first film to premiere here at the Toronto Film Festival. It's an exciting night. You are the most globally exciting festival in the world.
Hello and welcome to the press conference for The Good Lie. A few notes before we begin. This press conference will be screened live at www.tiff.net and still photographs will be made available on the TIFF Media site. Volunteers are in the room with microphones to assist you with your questions. Please remember to identify yourself and your media outlet. Please also note that no photographs are permitted during this press conference. Only the pre-approved wire services may take photography and we ask that you do so from the front row back. If you could take a few moments to turn your cell phones to silent. Our moderator for today is Richard Krauss, and it is now my pleasure to welcome the director, screenwriter, and cast for The Good Lie. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so, you know, as you we were told, uh, no photographs, please, during the, uh, uh, the press conference. But questions are allowed. I've spoken with some of you uh, individually about this, please. Uh, this is a really thought-provoking movie, and we really want to hear what you have to say about it. Um, we have an illustrious panel uh, joining us today. Uh, sitting next to me in a lovely blue jacket, uh, Philippe Ferradou won Best First Feature Film at TIFF in 2000. His film, Congo Rama, was presented as the uh, closing night ceremonies of the director's fourth night at Cannes. Monsieur Lazare was nominated for an Oscar in 2012 in the Best foreign language category, and of course, he is the director of The Good Lie. This is when we applaud. Reese Witherspoon won an Academy Award for her performance as June Carter Cash in Walk the Line, and has starred in everything from Legally Blonde, Election, Mud, and was last seen at TIFF uh, in The Devil's Knot. Her new company, Pacific Standard Films, has two new movies coming soon, uh, one very soon to TIFF, it's called Wild, uh, which she uh, stars in and has produced, and Gone Girl is also coming from uh, that company as well. So uh, please help me welcome Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> Who's next? Um, Arnold so Oseng? Oseng. 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 Uh, was featured in My Brother the Devil and the Channel 4 TV series Top Boy. Please help me welcome him. Uh, Emmanuel Jal, born in southern Sudan, uh, he is a hip-hop artist whose messages of peace and reconciliation will soon be heard on his fifth studio album called The Key. Uh, and you can hear, if you've seen the movie, and I know most of you have, uh, you've heard some of his songs already, Scars and We Fall are on the soundtrack. And uh, Ger Duani was born in South Sudan and in 2010 produced a documentary called Ger To Be Separate uh, on the search for his family after 18 years apart. He uh, has also appeared in I Heart Huckabees and Restless City. <laughs> and Kuith Wheel was born in a refugee camp to Sudanese parents who fled the Sudan for Ethiopia. This is her uh, really stunning screen debut. Please help. Let's welcome. Uh, Margaret Nagel first came to the attention of audiences and critics alike with her HBO film Warm Springs, which won an Emmy for Outstanding TV Movie and received 16 additional Emmy nominations uh, for this film, uh, which starred Kenneth Branagh and Cynthia Nixon as Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Nagel also received the Writers Guild of America Award for Outstanding Long Form Original TV Movie, as well as a long list of other awards. She has worked as a writer and supervising producer on the first season of Boardwalk Empire for HBO earning a WGA award for Outstanding New Series and an Emmy nomination for Outstanding Drama Series. Uh, currently, she is executive producing the new Fox drama series Red Band Society through Steven Spielberg's Amblin Television. She's very busy and she's taken some time out to be here today. And way down on the end of the panel, Corey Stoll from TV shows like The Strain, which I'm very happy is coming back for a second season. <laughs> Uh, and House of Cards, which I'm sad you're not on anymore, uh, to movies like Midnight... <laughs> Resurrection. That's right, yes, House of Cards of the Resurrection. I will watch that. Uh, two movies like Midnight in Paris, Glass Chain and Nonstop, uh, and the upcoming Ant-Man. Uh, we're very pleased to have Corey Stahl with us as well. Uh, congratulations uh, to you all. 
on the film. Um, you know, Philippe, you're sitting next to me, so let's start with you. When did you become aware of uh, this story and the, the import behind this story? Um, a friend uh, called me in, back in 1994 uh, to go with her to South Sudan. Uh, the famine was raging, and she wanted to do a film about people waiting for food uh, during the Civil War, and uh, clueless uh, and thinking that I had some experience in Africa and traveling, I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Um, and it was uh, one of the most difficult experiences of my life to see people dying uh, out of hunger, uh, waiting for food, food that were stacked just in front of them, uh, but they couldn't get to it because they were waiting, we were waiting for logisticians to distribute the food. Um, and, and at one point we had to be evacuated because a warlord was coming our way. Um, and uh, as I was leaving in the airplane, uh, I felt uh, a mixture of, of guilt and, and helplessness. And so 18 years after, when I read Margaret Nagel's script, uh, it, it touched a nerve, it, it made sense to me to go back to that story and finish something that I had started many years ago. And because I knew the people, you know, it was, it, they were, in the script, it talked about the Dinka. I knew the Dinka, I knew them, I, I, I knew people that probably died since then. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was some sort of calling. Reese, I'll move on to you. Uh, first of all, congratulations on having the good sense to work with two great French-Canadian directors, <laughs> both of which are, uh, those films are appearing at the festival this year, so congratulations on Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, same question, at what point did you become uh, aware of the story and, and begin to feel that this was uh, a story that, that you personally wanted to be involved in the telling of? Um, well, I come from the opposite perspective where I had absolutely no awareness of the situation. I had heard of the Lost Boys of Sudan, and other than a few news stories, I would not read very much. So when I read Margaret's script, I was just immediately touched and completely moved about the story from the perspective <coughs> of the refugee coming to America and the, the hardships that they endured as young children um, walking across the desert. I was just so moved. Um, and so I... I met with Philippe, and we just decided to make the film. And uh, I'm going to keep this pretty linear, <laughs> going down point by point here. Tell me when you all first saw the script, because uh, it, this experience and the experiences that are detailed in this story have touched some of you very personally in a very direct way. So tell me what your initial reaction was when you saw the script and uh, if it reflected an experience that you could relate to or or how, wh what your reaction was, is what I'm looking for. Um, personally, I, I, I first got the script, um, it was sent to be, to, it was sent to me by a, a friend of mine and he emailed it to me um, and he was, he, 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 we was, we was doing a theater play at the time and he emailed me and he said, Arnold, do you have like, American managers and American agents. And I said, no, I don't have that yet. And he said, well, you gotta get on board. My agent in the States just sent me this script. It's amazing, you'd, you'd be perfect for it. And then I said, great. So then he sent me the script, I read it, it was amazing. I sent it to my agent. And then I, I told Philippe this, I don't know if you remember, um, you guys didn't wanna see me because I wasn't tall enough. <laughs> so, so they turned me down, which was, which was a bummer. And then maybe like about a month later, it came back and, I had the audition, but yeah, when I first read the script, it was amazing. I really wanted to be a part of it. Um, the character of Mamere that I played, you know, his character goes through so many emotions during the film. And as an actor, you know, it's, you know, to be asked to play such a character um, with so much highs and lows and depth to him is a dream come true. So I was, I was so happy to be part of it. And for you, Emmanuel? When uh, I think I was approached differently, I was approached to help fine actors for it, so I wasn't really sure I was gonna be part of it because I wanted to help find people who can do justice to the story. And then uh, the director told me I should give it a try, so, and I was sent for the script. When I look at it, I read it once and I put it down and when I finished it, and it was really, really difficult to try to think about it and I found like, this is what happened. It looked like the person who was writing the script has been there and knows what is going on, but the 
it's like I was reading my own story. It's like I'm reading the story of S South Sudanese. It's like I'm reading the story of the people who got involved in that struggle. So it's no longer their stories about the network of how. But on a personal note, the way it affected me was, was it was painful for, me, for, for, for me for that time. So, and uh, I did not read it as much as this. I only stuck on the parts of that I'm supposed to act because I kind of like know what the story was about. W were there painful moments while you were making the film? Not <laughs> so you say that you know reading it was painful for you, but then you have to live it. You have to act it. Were there painful moments while you were making the film? Yes. Uh, n the the thing is what. What happened was uh, after when we're shooting the movies, how uh, Flip, because you understand I'm a musician, so you tell me take it like poetry. Because mm -hmm. I'm used to telling my story through music easily. But now this is a different form of art that I have to relieve it. Now you're talking about homes burned down, you talk about the helicopters, and all those things I've experienced it during that time. And so, and I had to try to immerse myself in it. Mm -hmm. But I kind of like got in it, and later on I was fine. And Gary, for you? <coughs> well, I came across this story a long, long time ago. Uh, ten years ago, when I was in Los Angeles, I met a man named Bobby Newmeyer, and and he, and he called me in his office, and then he told me that he wants to tell this story. Within that year, and then Bobby passed away, and then I thought this story died with Bobby. And then later on, which is 2013, when, when I came across the script, and then my emo I couldn't help my emotion because here's a story that I know that the person that wanted to tell it is no longer here. Mm -hmm. So even myself too, I move on. So I didn't know there was people that remained close to this story as much as Bobby, right. and that was this group of people. So when I read the script, I couldn't finish it because my journey was very long before I came to the United States. So I was among the kids that really walked to Ethiopia by foot. And when we were taking those long walks, we never thought that we can have something to offer to the world. We are just looking for help. We just, we didn't know that we can come this far and now we can share something important about our country. So it makes so much sense for me to work with people who kept this story close to their heart, such as Philip and Reeve and Margaret, who wrote incredible uh, scripts, so I couldn't wait to be part of it. But if I had to help in another aspect of it, I was ready to. Right. How did you uh, arrive at this? Because this is your debut. We've not seen you on the screen before. Um, well, the thing is, when I first got the script, I was still uh, in college. Right. And so I was a little reluctant at first to even audition because I didn't think that I had a chance or even a shot. But when I saw the script, I knew that it was special. It was different because I've never seen any type of writing like that, where it's specifically about the story of Sudan and about the Lost Boys. And when I initially read it, I had thought that the writer was actually from Sudan because it was so detailed and so everything was just paying attention to everything that had happened. And so when I got a chance to meet Margaret, and <laughs> I was a little shocked because she did so much research for the script. But um, I was glad that this is happening and I just felt like I was very honored to be a special part of it. How old were you when you left the refugee camp, went to Ethiopia? You were very small, right? Yes, I was born in Ethiopia in a refugee camp. Right. And when I was three years old, we went back to Sudan and that's where I lost my father. Mm -hmm. And then we went back to Ethiopia and immigrated to America at eight years old. Now, Margaret, how does it make you feel to hear Kuo say, I thought that the writer was from Sudan when she first saw this? Because this is a, a, a passion project for you. It's been something that you've worked on for a very long time. And I mean, there is, or can be, I suppose, no higher praise than that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is, I've been obsessed with this for a long time. And uh, Bobby Newmeyer, I, I you know, life is hard and people survive things and I've watched some people survive some pretty hard things in my own life and nothing obviously close, but I have older brothers and, and they went through something very deep and painful and I've watched the survival of us as siblings in this situation. So that was part of what I drew on and then 
I had, when I was trying to become a screenwriter, this is my first WGA job as a screenwriter. Wow. This is my first job, this wow. job. <laughs> so um, this is yeah. how I got in the Writer's Guild. Wow. <laughs> and um, I had been, had a part-time job selling purses out of the trunk of my car. Really? And these <laughs> That's guys. my next movie. That's yeah, my next yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, I, I, that, that sounds a little illegal, too. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. Wait, I paid taxes. So um, <laughs> I declared everything, but I was called the bag lady. And, and two of the guys that supplied my bags were from Senegal, and they were had, of Sudanese descent who had gone to Senegal. One, his father was a chief who had 11 wives, and one, would, and, but he had one wife in America, but his father had had 11 wives. He had like 100 brothers and sisters. And the other guy was. Uh, he had three wives, and he was a young guy with three wives, and he was going through really difficult times trying to manage three wives. <laughs> and um, they came to Thanksgiving at my house, Then we became very close, I became close to their children, and I watched them trying to assimilate and come to America, and asked me so many questions, and nothing was harder than 9-11. Right. That was the, and I went and s went and saw them that day on 9-11, and had to pick things up from them, and we just sat in the back of the store, which was called Dakar, and, uh -huh. and talked about what the heck was going on. And, and, there, and they explained it to me. So anyway, when I saw, I'd written the spec script, Warm Springs, and I was going to be a writer, and I was selling my bags, and it was like, had this big, and there was an announcement in Variety that Bobby Newmeyer, Robert Newmeyer, was going to do a movie about the Lost Boys, and he was looking for a writer. So I called my brand new agent, and I was like, get me a meeting. And he was like, okay, you know, there are a lot of big screenwriters going in for this, you know, that Margaret, you're kind of the last person he's going to meet. And I was like, I, I, I swear, I, I, I know I could write this. And I just started doing all this research about Sudan. And, and when I do research, I'm, I'm a crazy researcher. And got LexisNexis and printed up every single article written about Sudan and immigration in Africa and just, I have binders this thick of newspaper articles and I had never taken a meeting to pitch a movie before and I finally got a meeting with the assistant's assistant and I went in and I had the whole movie ready to pitch. Theo and Mamere, Paul and Jeremiah, the, the woman in Kansas City. I, I like had the whole thing planned out and they were like, okay, slow down girl, slow down, slow down, slow down. <laughs> And finally I met, I spent the entire day at Outlaw Productions just meeting more people and pitching the movie over and over again. And then the, finally they walked me into Paramount and they said, this is this girl and she's, you know, scale plus 10, it's a bargain, you know. <laughs> and so I got the job and then spent the next, and then Bobby died a couple years later and it went into turnaround. And then I, uh, the Writers Guild reacquisition rule is that it's a little known rule that if you have a, a screenplay, that has no underlying rights and that no one else has written on, after five years of turnaround, you can take it out for a free 18-month option. So I counted down the days, walked into Paramount, and said, give me my script back. And then I went back out and I found Imagine. And then, so, worked on it for 12 months with them, and then we lost the financing. <laughs> so I had six months left, and I kept saying, let's give it to the people who made The Blind Side. Let's get, what, who are those guys? Who are those people? And then um, I, took it there and it got thrown into a pile and Molly Smith, who was starting a label with Alcon for Black Label Media, her new company, got the script and I kept saying, I just know there's someone there and it turns out Molly Smith's brother is a lost boy, adopted at her church in Memphis, her father sent him to engineering school and he now works for her father. So it got, it got, I, I was like, we just need one yes. We need one yes. We don't, I, I've had hundreds of no's, one yes. And we, we found it in Molly. So, and then her partners and Imagine and everyone came together. And I'd written, this is the last thing and I'll shut up. I, when I was no, you won't. selling my bags, I wrote the part for Reese Witherspoon. I was like, you know, you ima I imagine Ken Brana in Warm Springs uh, which was later, and then that got made. But I imagined Reese, and I named it Carrie because I thought it was a good name for Reese. <laughs> Do you know, I, I really, you'd be a great Carrie, and you are. So there's like a, there's like it, you know. Thank God we're here. Thank. And, and yesterday was amazing to see you guys, and it's just it's incredible.
I, I think I was going to follow up by saying this is the one that got your WGA card, and, and how does it feel here to be here today after all this time? But I think we know. Yes, yeah, sorry. I think we know. Corey, um, tell me what your way into this was, and, and if you were familiar uh, with the situation beforehand, or, or was the story a revelation to you? Well, I think like Reese, I was coming from a place of uh, not, you know, not ignorance, but you know, it was, it was, it was. I didn't know that much about it. I had read the the novel What Is the What, um, which is, you know, has some similarities to to, to the story, which was I thought beautiful and incredibly moving. Um, and I read the script, and and within the first thirty pages, uh, seeing how much attention was 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 being paid to the the the, the lost boys and girls, mm -hmm. um, and that we didn't even you know I was like we're in page thirty we're still not <laughs> we're still not in America this is this is great this yeah. this movie um, is determined to tell their story. Um, and uh, I was I was sold even before I got to where my character enters into it, um, and then meeting with Philippe over over Skype and seeing uh, Mr. Lazar, which which was so beautiful and so um, so delicately threads that needle between you know uh, humor and pathos, which mm -hmm. is essential for telling this story. Um, that, uh, I mean, I was just honored to, to, to be a part of it. That will be my next question about finding the balance because this movie, while it tells a very important story and it tells a story that has certainly some, some very dark aspects to it, is very funny as well. There are a lot of lighter moments. So um, I'll start and then I'll throw it over to the audience. Uh, tell me a little bit about finding the balance between this because you don't want to in any way disrespect the story by you know, injecting uh, humor that shouldn't be in there or what, but the, the movie does have a nice little flow to it. Uh, we could do a master class uh, for, for three weeks about finding the balance for a story like that because reading the script in the airplane, I was like, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, grip, it was a gripping story at the beginning and then I was laughing out loud <laughs> in the plane and then I was crying at the end, and the, 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 the people came to see me, are you all right, Monsieur Ferrado? And no, I'm not. <laughs> and, and, and then I thought, I want to do this, but how the hell am I going to yeah, do yeah. one film with something that seems like might be three different stories? And I, I instinctively felt that it was one story, but we had to craft this uh, in a very specific way so it didn't feel like three stories. And, and I know that when we, I, we Reese and I met, we discussed that at length because we knew that if we wanted to bring this to a wider audience, uh, they would expect an American angle, an American perspective on, on this story, which the character of Carrie brings. And there was discussion of should we bring you know, the Africa in flashback instead. We, we went through all of this, um, uh, bringing her character after 35 minutes was certainly something perhaps new. Uh, f and and I, t I remember telling her, well, Hitchcock killed his star after 30 minutes in Psycho. I'm gonna introduce you in the film after 30 <laughs> yeah. minutes and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna kill you. And, but we, 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 we went at length in trying to craft one tone and I think it's, it, it all comes down to the, 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 the acting, mm -hmm. uh, the level of authenticity of the acting, um, and probably also the, the images of uh, Ronald Plant, who is sustaining something coherent from beginning to end, but uh, also making sure that the, uh, the war scenes at the beginning were not too graphics. Uh, of course, as any director, I wanted, you know, a boy with toys and helicopters, and, and I wanted to do something probably more violent and, 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 uh, and, and real, but we realized very early while shooting that we couldn't go there because of the second part of the movie. Mm -hmm. and, and it was not a war movie, it was not about that, it was about togetherness, it was about, it was about the family sticking together and surviving. And so with all these little adjustments, as we were going on, I think we found the right tone. I know Bruce Kirkland has a question. <laughs> we'll bring you a microphone, Bruce. Um, Bruce Kirkland, uh, Toronto Sun, Sun Media. Uh, I have a question for Reese Witherspoon, but I have to say that uh, Margaret Nagel's story about how this film got made 
is the most extraordinary insight into how the it hangs on a on a thin thread to get any good original movie made these days. And thanks for you to hanging on all this time and getting it done with these wonderful people. So that's part of my question for uh, Reese Witherspoon because you come from the other extreme through your production company, through your prominence as, as a movie actor, you can get certain films made. And making that choice for a film like this that turned out to be written for you is kind of exciting. You have another film that we're gonna talk about this afternoon, Wild, The Wild. So if you could talk about how you now, at this point in your life, enable films because you get excited about them and make that specific about this one as well. And we're out of time. No, I was just, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, first of all. That's, that's a, you know, thank you for recognizing that. I feel like um, I'm, I'm very lucky in that I get sent a lot of wonderful scripts um, and I'm, I feel really so blessed that Margaret said that she wrote something for me in the spirit of me because that makes me feel great that she sort of um, saw me as this protector of these people and, and also just almost coming at it from a, a point of view of not knowing. I think, you know, uh, having a perspective of being an American and and seeing it through that lens I think is, is sometimes great. And I think, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm lucky to have these opportunities to be able to help facilitate these things, but they're not possible if we don't have the kind of passion that Margaret brings to the project or Molly Smith pouring through material and finding this gem in the pile of things that are sent to her. And then the sensitivity with which to deal with the subject matter. I would have never agreed to do the, the movie if I hadn't spoken to Philippe and understood that he wasn't making a, a movie about an American who comes in to save the day for a bunch of Sudanese refugees. It was truly their story. And we talked about it from the beginning. And it was like, because my perspective was, I just want as many people to hear this story as possible. Um, and what's our way in? How do, we, how do we get people in? And from the, the very first meeting, he said to me, this is, a, he said to me, I just, I've never had a, a director say this to me. He goes, this, I really like you and I respect you, Reese, but this movie has nothing to do with you. <laughs> 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 it's like, it's all about the Sudanese people. And I loved he that. Say that. He did, but he did, and I, and I agreed, because it was. You read between the lines, but I didn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> Maybe that's what you meant. Um, but, and, and he was determined to tell their story, and not in a saccharine, maudlin way, but with truth and honesty and dignity and almost in a documentary style. And what he didn't say about the humor was, there was a lot of jokes in there that were, um, that we, you know, he, through the editing process, which I think he did an incredible job with his editor, um, just found the perfect tone for the film, because it could have been a very unbalanced, um, film with, you know, one side of it felt very real and documentary style and the rest of it felt very jokey and American. Um, so I think he did a beautiful job also finding a moment for each character and really find the humanity. I feel like Corey's character has a beautiful moment where he talks about being a soldier, an American soldier. And Gare's character has beautiful uh, speeches about, you know, his faith and how important that is. And Paul and Mamere obviously having this big life decision, but I think Philippe did an, a, an amazing job at finding those moments of humanity in all of us and how, how we are all just, we're all the same. Is a question right there, yeah. I have a, uh, two questions for Luis, if it's possible. One is really fast that if you are a good liar, if actors are good liars, and the second would be since you are doing two real life stories, what part of Reese Witherspoon life would make a good movie? Um, yeah, well, I mean, actors are great liars, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> are we really good liars? I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Are you lying or telling the truth right oh, now? Yeah. I can't tell. Uh -huh. um, Does that mean lying well or telling good lies? That's exactly, a good that's yeah. a good point. In this um, case, we're good liars. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then the second half. What, what I think what, was what what part what of, my part life of your life would make press conference the oh, movie? Not. No. <laughs> There's so many things that 
hopefully no one will ever know until I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe after that. <laughs> uh, let's move on. Yeah, go ahead. Hi there. Heather Seaman from Rogers TV. Congratulations to everyone on the film. My question, um, I have two questions. Uh, Arnold, unlike the other characters that played your siblings, you were not born in a refugee camp. So I'm wondering how you drew on uh, their experiences for your character as well as family. And my second question is for all the four characters that played siblings. Um, we know that we don't often see black uh, actors in lead roles. Um, as Sudanese actors, we don't often see Sudanese actors in Hollywood. So what? black as it comes. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I'm wondering, what's next for you? Because there are a lot of challenges ahead, I'm sure. Um, you know, trying to get your way through Hollywood. So Arnold, and then all four of you, if you can respond. Oh, Thank you. That, that was an excellent question. Um, uh, how I, like you said, I didn't, I, I didn't come from their background, um, but um, I always refer to it because Gare always says, how do you say it? You say it the best. I never say it like you, like you do. How do you but say it? The war affected us in many different ways. It's either indirectly or directly. Or directly, that's it. War, I think we all came together because in some way, shape, or form, war has affected us, either directly or indirectly. You know, <clears throat> um, what people don't know is I, I, I come from a family of refugees myself, and then we came to London, um, and that's where, that's where I grew up. So this, this story is very close to me as well. But how I got into character is um, what Philippe done is he made us, um, especially the, the, um, Gare and, 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 and Emmanuel, he made us come together. And I think we had like workshops. Was it a month of workshops or like? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, was a, it was a tough time. But yeah, we, we had a, like a month of workshops so we could um, come together, gel, um, and just start, start bouncing off each other and start learning. I did find it difficult at, at first. Um, I did feel a bit like an outsider, especially because I was British number one. Um, my I, yeah, I had to learn his accent. I mean, I had, I had a dialect coach as well. Um, I, I I tried to lose Good weight. Point. Did I try? You <laughs> failed. <laughs> hey, I, listen, I, I lost a few pounds. Um, so yeah, I mean, every day on set, I just um, I I just learned everything from them, and I was like a sponge soaking up. Every, everything they told me. I mean, what they told me certain stories that they necessarily haven't even told other people before. So they, they you know, they trusted me with, with information. But I needed that so I can um, bring my mare to life. You know, I mean, obviously Margaret Nagel's writing is amazing, but I needed that extra realism <laughs> that I got from them to help my character come to fruition, so. We, we, cannot, we cannot overstate the amount of work that uh, Arnold has done and I felt the pressure on his shoulder at, at one point, and, and uh, I felt a bit responsible for that because I, I wanted him to, to you know, walk, eat, sleep with the, the other guys. And, and at some point I realized, Philip, this is, this is a, an actor. He will be able to act it out. He, he doesn't need to become one of them. And, uh, but he, he did uh, put in uh, a, a weeks of hard work um, and, and uh, uh, I, I'm grateful for, for that, uh, Arnold, really. And, and yeah. Uh, Paul, what was the other part of the question again? Uh, You're asking about the black actors yeah. and all of that. I think here it goes to the conscience of who are the people behind the film. So if you look like Philip is he's like a silent activist who speaks through his films and doesn't put a mes message on your throat. So basically when he read the script, he said, look, I want this to be as authentic as it could and I need South Sudanese involved, this is their story. And he took a big risk because we don't have many actors. When I was actually approached, I told him I know one actor and he's based in New York and that's Gear. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and they keep asking him, you gotta help us, pass the word around, you know? And so looking for actors, so, and you know when, story of a true story that comes out that want to be authentic as possible, it will always have a direct impact. And also if you look at it is, 
the invisible angels that were not seen, you know, for you to bring their work and connecting it in the story. I think it, a lot of credit will go to, the, to Philippa because you want to see how would the South Sudanese back there think they know about the story. This is their stories being told. This is their connection with American. So even making the movie, I think just by involving me and Gare, because we have the knowledge, we actually help the movie shift direction in certain aspect, you know, like to give, okay, if you're talking about uh, war in, uh, in slavery taking place, then slavery would have taken place here. And if you're gonna go to Ethiopia, you have to pass through Nuerland, so which means these guys have to be Dinka, and bringing those, and also bringing the elements, the music that the Lost Boys used to sing. And so we, we help bring that kind of thing to help it make it uh, be where it, although most of the work has been done. Are we going to start singing now? Yeah, Reese was dancing as well. African dancing, we taught her. Okay. Well, I'm just grateful that there's a movie have to be told, about, you know, directly about our story as a Southern Sudanese. So a lot of people have to understand that South Sudan, or Sudan went to war since 1955. Most of us was not obviously born at that time, maybe our parents. And most of us, we yes, we are affected by civil war indirectly or directly. Emmanuel and I, we participated in the war for many years. I was there for 10 years during the civil war. And this guy, and they were born in refugee camps. There's a lot of stories. There's many people that was born in refugee camp became grandmothers to the kid that they born in refugee camp. And these stories are not here. So I'm just grateful that Hollywood turn around and try to tell our story. And this could be a responsibility for a newest nation in the world that America has pushed for to stand as a new state. And uh, this is our responsibility to really share something with everybody. Uh, we're grateful. That's the bottom line. Um, I think that um, as far as being a black actress, um, I'm very grateful. But I don't think there are any limitations. Like, I don't like to give myself limitations because this industry is about a collaborative effort of art. So I don't see myself as, oh, because I'm black, I should limit myself to this. No, if that's the case, then you make the stories. If you see that there are no roles for you, I myself think that, okay, then it's up to me to tell those stories about these women, about black women, about myself. And so I don't think that there are um, that many issues that I see ahead of me. It's just about being right for the right role. Yeah. I think just to add on about the, the black thing in it, the way I look at sometimes when I look at Africa, we have not developed our movie industry to be that big. So we have to be realistic. If, for example, if I'm a model in a place where there's a lot of white people, you know, out of every 50 models and you have like 25 models, I mean, it would not work realistically for a little kid who's growing. So if they're seeing a lot, you go to African place now, you'll find most of the models there. If you just have a white model as the leading model in that area, it's not going to connect with a lot of, so if you have a balance, then it works. But if the stories connect in, like the way now the story connects in the culture and how these human beings come together, so it make it work. And also it goes to the writers. How do they want to create an impact to bring people together as humans? Like when I'm looking at this movie, the writer played a big part just bringing American story, a South Sudanese story, and all other people that got involved and just brought that humanity. When you're watching that movie, you don't see black or white. You just see human beings empathizing for each other and wanting to help each other. We are out of time for questions, but stay seated uh, because that question, or your last answer, dovetails uh, really beautifully into a very special announcement that we're going to make today. Um, I'm not going to make it. I think Margaret, are you? Uh, yeah, Margaret's going to uh, give you some uh, news of uh, a very empathetic nature. Well, we're, we've created a fund, and, and Bobby Newmeyer wanted the the agreement was that you know there 3,600 lost boys came to this country, and and I made uh, a fictionalized story based on real events, and uh, we 
this good life, we cre we're creating a good life fund, uh, and it's got a big startup piece of money. And uh, the idea, and it's, it's Imagine, it's Black Label, it's Warner Brothers, um, it's Alcon, and, um, and it's for humanitarian and educational needs of lost boys and girls and uh, who were uprooted, many of whom are still in the Kakuma refugee camp. You know, the program was stopped, and there's a whole bunch of people that have been living in that camp for a very long time. So we want to go help with the camp. We want to we want to create schools. We want kids here, young, young people, to be able to finish their education. And the fund is, we're going to call it, uh, we're going to have a lot of fundraising elements to it. We're having a big Washington, D.C event in mid-September and all these humanitarian aid programs are getting involved and we're inviting everybody to get involved and as you notice at the end of the, the screening there's uh, a place where you can go and if you want to donate anybody watching the film wants to donate money but there's going to be a lot of things that you're going to be hearing about in the future involved with this and this was always this is Bobby Newmeyer's dream this is Warner's dream this is Alcon imagine you know black media this is uh, black label media we, this is what we all want to see happen because since I started writing this movie, there is a South Sudan. You have to understand, I mean, they, they, it didn't exist. And now it's there and lost boys are going back to their country to do things. I mean, it, it's a big, but Sudan is, South Sudan is in a very, very sensitive place right now. And there is a famine just about to start. And so this is a time that we can use this film to educate people and help people understand what's really going on, maybe on a more emotional level, so that they can realize, oh my gosh, I can help with the newest country, the newest country on, in the world. It's so exciting. So anyway, that's the announcement. The website, oh gosh, my glasses, I'm so sorry. Uh, uh, www, the good lie. The good lie fund. Uh, fund.org. .org. So. Uh, so thank you all uh, very much for coming. Thank you, everyone. The good lie, good movie, and a good cause. Thank, thank you. you very much.